James Cameron's life changed in 1984 when he wrote and directed The Terminator, a film that inspired a new franchise. I'll be back. Suddenly, his name was synonymous with sci-fi action. Get away from her, you bitch! <laughs> and big budget projects. You are not in Kansas anymore. You are on Pandora. Now, 13 years after it was first released, one of his biggest blockbusters, Avatar, is back in cinemas. You should see your faces. Digitally remastered, its return signals the beginning of a new chapter, with four sequels scheduled for release over the next six years. James Cameron, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure, thank you. A whole generation has only seen Avatar on a small screen. Mm. How much are they missing by not having the full cinema 3D experience and the physical experience of cinema sound? Well, I think it's a huge difference. It's really chalk and cheese, you know, because you've got the you've got the 3D, you've got the new laser projection. I mean, the film on this re-release will look better than it's ever looked. I know the film very well, as you can imagine, but even when I sit and watch it now, I'm quite amazed by the advance in the presentation. Now, we're not just looking at the release of a remastered Avatar. It's now part of a, a multi-film series. There's going to be four Avatar sequels. Mm -hmm. That on its own is an incredible feat of organization and art together that just boggles my mind. But, boggles um, mine too. <laughs> <laughs> but let me ask you this question. Do you lose anything when you give up the idea of a single film, a single story? I think you lose and you gain. You know, so we live now in a world of streaming where people love stories that, that may go across six hours, eight hours, whatever. They're, they're used to when they embrace IP when they embrace a world, characters and so on, they want more of those characters. Mm. You know, whether it's Game of Thrones or, or Stranger Things or whatever it is, people invest and they just want more, mm. you know. So I thought, well, why not, why not play that game at the same time as doing what I've always done, which is, you know, feature films that, that button off, that tell a story and have a, a, a decisive resolution. And I think you can do both. All right. But then what happens to the idea of dramatic jeopardy, which is what we're used to in a uh, film? Will my central character, will he live? Will he die? Um, do, you, do you have to give up some of the jeopardy if I know that the, my, my character is going to live on f through a series of films? Well, I would say that if you're doing a, a, a series that's superhero, like a superhero franchise, mm. nobody's going to kill off Batman. Nobody's going to kill off Iron Man, right? Well, of course they did, but but uh, 26 films into it, yes. you see what I mean? Yes. We uh, we have real jeopardy, and yeah. we have real loss, and real grief in in this series, starting with the first film. So be warned. You made me think of something. You're you're also a, a renowned screenwriter. How different is that? Is it conceptually to think about that multi-part series as opposed to a narrative with a beginning, middle, and end within the two hours or three hours? I think it's 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 very different and mm. it's very challenging, but it's very fun as well because you know that the work you're doing as a writer is going to pay off over over time. It's a much more novelistic sort of approach. So the first thing I did was was generate the greater story arc, the sort of what I call the meta narrative, right? And then within it, work out my my individual films. And that was a four year project for me. I think you've indicated that you are you're not necessarily going to film the not necessarily sorry going to direct the last episode of the series. How do you cede control of something that you have been so meticulous in planning and creating? It's a succession plan, yep. right? Um, and, uh, y you know, look, if I can do them all, great. I'd mm. love to, uh, you know, but something may come along that piques my interest and I may feel that there's enough momentum with my team mm -hmm. that they can do it. So to me, the, you know, that there are no decisions being made there. You know, I've already, I've already completed, almost completed two. We've shot three. Mm. We've shot part of four. Uh, I love them all. I'd love to go all the way through the end of, the end of five. But, you know, I'm, I'm 
you know, not getting any younger, and none of us are. So I, I want this. I want uh, the, the people that pay the bills on this, and it's a very high bill. Uh, Disney to feel like this is an open-ended thing. We talked before about how streaming, you know, the the immense influence of streaming on cinema. Is there any possibility that you could take on television? Oh, absolutely, yeah, and that would be a, a kind of a side hustle because the Avatar films are pretty, pretty all-consuming. I don't think I could go off and direct another film mm. while I'm in this cycle, this this kind of epic cycle. But we could certainly produce television. I, I love it. I love working as a producer, working with writers, writers rooms, creating worlds, creating characters, all that. I just, I love it. We were talking before about the remastering of, of Avatar. When you think about the film, if you had come through the world of video games mm -hmm. where everything is created from the computer, do you think your films would look different if you hadn't come through cinema? Well, I, yeah, I came up through, you know, real-world cinematic uh, photography and a lot of hand-holding of the camera mm. and really knowing one's lenses and so on and that play of light and lens flares and all the things that, that tell us, that signal to us that what you're seeing is real photography of a real subject. Mm. So now you take that and transpose that into the CG world and the more outlandish the world, the more I think we have to play by, by those rules. So I think CG artists are, are pretty hip to those tricks now, even though they don't necessarily come from, from you know, cinematography per se, they, but they, they've figured it out, you know. In the early days, they hadn't, mm. you know. So, so, you know, that was part of the culture that we had to create. And this is going back 30 years now to the, the dawn of, of CG cinema. So when you bring your directing techniques into a film like Avatar, how do you create the intimacy in those scenes when we're watching them again? It's not like we're watching a, 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 an epic from a distance. It's still intimate. How do you do that cinematographically? Yeah, because I'm, I'm working against the, the kind of uh, overwhelming um, eye candy of the world. So mm -hmm. to, to focus the audience on the relationships, I have to, I have to be in here on mm -hmm. my characters. So it starts with the writing, you know, writing, I think, scenes that have an intimacy and then encouraging that with the actors. Because it's an actor-driven process, uh, even though ultimately the, the, the end result are, are computer-generated characters those characters are actor driven right mm -hmm. and it's their performances that we strive you know that are that our utmost goal is to preserve everything they did um, so then it's just the work with the actors which is actually quite enjoyable when you're when you're doing a film like this because you're not worried about cameras and lighting mm -hmm. and dolly track and mm -hmm. extras in the background and all that stuff you're really just working the scene mm -hmm. and the actors love it because it's it's almost like theater rehearsal do you use a handheld camera when you're directing, Absolutely. when you're filming? Absolutely. So then once I have those performances captured, then I go in with my virtual camera, which is handheld, and I can either be handheld for the final film, or I can simulate a dolly shot or a steady cam shot or a helicopter shot, whatever it is. I do it all handheld, but then we, we discipline ourselves to say, but is it a handheld shot? Or is it a helicopter shot or, or you know, a steady cam shot? And we have tools to take my basic moves and turn them into to looking like they were shot that way. You're a scientist by training, and there's a great deal of science mm. in, in your films. Um, but I noticed you said that you encouraged a sort of spiritual, even messianic um, dimension to the scripts mm -hmm, in Avatar mm -hmm. as it develops. Is that you changing for the very, from the very empirical James Cameron of your early days? I think it's me as an artist dealing with the empiricism versus the versus what you want the world to be. And you want the world to have a greater meaning and, and things that you don't quite understand but that make sense and that, that sort of protect us in our in our little lives and all the all of those things that we're we're attracted to in a kind of a spiritual or religious interpretation of our this reality that we we all inhabit, right? So this is me saying, all right, well, science is the is the path to truth, but there's this other thing that's very attractive and interesting, and that as a as a writer, I, I love to deal with. And those two things are at war, mm -hmm. you know, in in my mind, and I think in in society. You know, I I love technology, but I also fear technology, and to me, that's the 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 grist for the mill of of great drama. Mm -hmm. How much are you motivated by your environmental concerns? Very, very motivated by my environmental concerns. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I take sustainability very seriously. Most people sort of think of it as something that's token or a little bit of greenwashing here and there. Mm -hmm. I think of sustainability as how is the human race going to live? What will it look like 100 years from now? Mm -hmm. 
you know, people aren't, aren't thinking on a hundred year horizon. It's a, sort of the seventh generation mentality that a lot of indigenous people have. Now, clearly you're diving, um, you're, the extraordinary experiences you've had um, very, very deep in the ocean mm -hmm. have informed everything about your aesthetic and your filmmaking. Is that where your interior landscape comes from, your visual landscape? Does it, does it really come from deep in the ocean? I think it's it's not necessarily deep, but it's certainly under the ocean. You know, some of the some of the greatest beauty is in the is in the top ten meters. Mm, you know, yes. that's where you get the beautiful light. That's mm. where you get the beautiful colors, and there's such an abundance of life up where sunlight supports it. And the deeper you go, kind of the, the bleaker darker. it gets. Yeah. Although it gets much more mysterious and interesting from a sci scientific perspective. But I think to me, the, the the ocean is part of my subconscious. So my dreams and the ocean are very intermingled. You know, that scene walking through the jungle at night, it really is like anyone's first experience of scuba diving. Yeah, yeah. If you dive at night, your first night dives, you'll be able to move your hand through the water and see it activate little bioluminescent, mm. you know, dinoflagellates, you know, that are emitting light. And you say, wow, there's light everywhere down here. It's, it's quite amazing. You know, I want to talk to you all day, but let me ask you this as a final question. What makes a true epic, a successful epic film? Well, I think not all epics are successful, but exactly. but I think I think it's I think it's some c capturing some uh, universal truth of human behavior and human existence, right? And I think to be successful in our our global marketplace, um, it has to be something universal across all cultures. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you can set it back in time, like Titanic, remove all of the day-to-day -day touchstones and trigger points for people, and put it in some some other time, or you can put it in some other world. For example, you know, like a, like Avatar, and we'll go there together, and we'll. But it has to mean something. It can't just be completely escapist candy. It has to has to mean something, and there has to be scale, right? There have to be beautiful landscapes. There have to be epic ideas in it. You know, m major conflicts. You know, classic conflict, good and evil. But mm -hmm. what is that? You know, everybody defines their good and evil differently. Well, I look forward to watching the next Avatar and this remastered Avatar through that lens of what is good and evil. Yeah, well, thank you. I hope you enjoy them both. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah.